Hello everyone virtually. Um, this is our, I think our first OVAC virtual, well I guess we had the happy hours, but this is our first like OVAC event that we're doing virtual and our first artist survival kit series event virtual. So we're really excited that everyone's able to join us. Um, so just some little uh, information about the Artist Survival Kit series. It's our professional workshop uh, program. So it's just teaching artists um, the business side of art, which you don't really learn in art school all the time, um, and just giving them the tools to really be successful um, on that end. Um, so we have forums, which is what this event is tonight. And we have workshops and office hours, and they're all really helpful. And they're on our website. If there's any information that you don't see tonight, you might get more information in those events. So um, yes, that's that. Um, so for our Zoom event tonight, um, we this is our first one, so we're kind of playing with it. So if something happens that technology seems to bring up for us, um, please bear with us. Um, um, and we hope the audience will please keep their mics muted throughout this talk, just so we can make sure we're hearing the speakers and the questions. Um, and if you have any questions, please add them to the chat. Um, over during the panel, I'll be kind of moderating that, compiling your questions and comments. And at the Q&A portion around 6.45, um, we'll switch to that and I can ask them to the panelists. Um, so, um, and also this is being recorded. We're going to save this and put it on our website for people to access if, you know, there was a great piece of information that you want to come back to later on, you'll be able to get it there. And also just to share it with um, our, our community out there. So, um, Wanted to share a couple upcoming OVAC events. Um, the first being our first ever Oklahoma art crawl. I'm sure a lot of you are aware of and are probably participating in. Um, so that is June 27th and 28th um, from 5 p.m. 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. both days. Um, if you're not participating as an artist, I hope you'll be able to participate as um, in and visit the art that we're going to see that day. Um, and it's statewide, so there's somewhere out there close to you, you'll be able to visit. Um, our next event is actually part of our uh, Ask series. Um, it's for next month, which is still July. Time is kind of blending together in my mind, so. Um, and it's actually, um, we're still figuring out the time, but it's going to be a conversation with Heather Darcy uh, Bidari, if I'm saying that last name correctly, and Jennifer Scanlon. Um, so Heather is the author of this great book, Artwork. I don't know if you all have seen it before. Um, it's pretty great. Um, I'm sure it's available at a bookseller near you or online on Amazon, whichever um, seller you prefer. Um, and they're gonna have a great conversation in July and we're really lucky to have both of them participating. Um, it'll also be virtual kind of like this. So hopefully, you know, we learn all the things in this conversation today. <laughs> um, our other uh, event coming up is July 15th is our next artist grant deadline. And there's more information on our website and links to applications will be there as well. And finally, <laughs> we have a busy summer. So um, July 25th is our annual members meeting. So. I'm sure many members are on this um, call right now, and I really hope you guys join us then. It's also virtual. Um, it'll just be, you know, a time to give you, uh, have us talk about the previous year, um, what we have planned in the upcoming year, and get your feedback on um, everything OVAC related. So, um, so that's what we have planned this summer. Um, a lot going on. Um, so yeah, and I think we should go ahead and get started. So our panel is being moderated by our excellent executive director, Crystal Brewer, and she'll um, get us going. So, and I'll also uh, 
just kind of share all that information in the chat so you guys can get back to it later on. So, um, all right, Crystal. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna switch host back to Haley. Here we go. Okay, great. Uh, well, I just wanna say, you know, thank you all so much for, for joining us today and a special thank you to our panelists that are gonna share their experiences and expertise. You know, this is a, a an unavoidable topic in the arts. We're all going to get rejected uh, multiple times throughout a career as an artist. And so hopefully our panelists today can equip you with a few things. One being, you know, tips and tricks of how to cope with rejection because it never feels great. Um, also, maybe some tips on how to uh, not get rejected for little things that you can um, uh, improve yourself by kind of knowing what curators are looking for and then also a little bit of behind the scenes of sometimes understanding the process uh, if you ever have the opportunity to jury something to do that experience yourself so that you can kind of see from the perspective of a, of a curator and making those decisions so um, so we'll go ahead and introduce our panelists and in lieu of me reading a long paragraph of all of their accomplishments it's a lot more um, impactful to hear it from them themselves. So we'll start with introductions and then we'll get going into uh, questions. So I'm just gonna go in the order I see you on my screen. So Suzanne, do you wanna start? Uh, sure, my name is uh, Suzanne Thomas. I am an artist. I lately have been doing more fiber works, but I am a painter. I uh, teach at Rose State College, uh, professor of art there. I'm also on, um, I've been a volunteer uh, with OVAC, I've been a volunteer with IAO, I've been around for a while, and I serve on the board actually of Inclusion in Art. And like I said, uh, at this point, what I'm doing is more fiber embroidery work, combining embroidery with painting and layers, and uh, having great fun with that. Um, and so basically, let's see, I'm, I'm kind of looking at some notes, um, how it fits into my, well, this is what I do. I, I do art in one capacity or another full time, either teaching it or showing it or that. So that's me. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jeffrey? Hi, I'm uh, Jeffrey Hicks. I'm an artist based in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, I do a lot. Uh, recently, I do a lot of installation art that is uh, generally based around uh, interactions with technology. So a lot of it is um, interactive. Uh, or responsive. Uh, sometimes it involves uh, mechanical things like robotics. Uh, sometimes it's like uh, more digital. Um, and I've been making this art for almost maybe 15 years now. Um, I have a long, um, I've been a lot of OVAC shows over the years, so I'm, I, I am very thankful to OVAC. OVAC is great. Um, uh, my first OVAC show was probably 2006 or 2007, so a long time ago. Um, and uh, up until uh, recently, I showed mostly in Oklahoma, but as of a couple years ago, I started really venturing out um, to apply things across the country, and I've had several shows across the country recently. Okay, great. And Kyle. All right. Um, thanks, Crystal and, and Haley, for putting this together and inviting me. Uh, my name is Kyle Larson, and uh, I live in Alva, Oklahoma. That's in uh, northwest Oklahoma. And um, I'm originally from Sacramento, California, um, and lived in Boston before I moved to Oklahoma for six years and, and came here in, in 2015 to teach at Northwestern Oklahoma State University, where I'm a, an associate professor of art and the director of the visual arts program here. Um, I'm a painter. I, I primarily paint, but I've also been experimenting with mixed media, works on paper, uh, large uh, room-sized installation. Um, I also run uh, the NWOSU Artist in Residence program here at Northwestern, um, where I invite uh, one to two artists a month um, to work and live in ALBA and uh, help with classes and interact with students. They have their own studio and, and um, have an exhibition at the end of their stay. They do an artist lecture and workshop. Um, if, if anyone's interested in that, it's NWOSU AIR.com. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, uh, so I, I find that uh, being an artist, interacting with artists is the way I move through the world. And um, rejection is definitely uh, when, when trying to get your work out there is, is the norm. 
really, <laughs> I come to expect it more than anything else. Um, yeah, and um, I uh, mostly um, have, have uh, shown where I live. I, I, I had shows in California. Um, when I moved to Boston, I, I started to have shows there. And I'm um, in Oklahoma, and it's only recently where I've started to expand. I had my first show in, in New York, or I was part of a group show in New York uh, last summer. Um, so, yeah, that, that's a little about me. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And thank you again for being here and sharing all of your expertise. I was really interested in this uh, group of panelists because all of you have a little bit of a different perspective. Um, certainly as, as educators, that's one perspective. Um, working in kind of more of a, a traditional 2D format versus Jeffries, which is kind of more installation. And so applying for different types of calls, such as, you know, calls for entry, RFQs, RFPs, things like that. And so I, I think before we delve into how to respond to getting told no, if we could talk about where do you go about finding opportunities? What are the types of things that you are looking for? Um, do you have any ways that you track, keep track of all the things that you're applying for? Maybe how many, um, uh, how often are you applying for things too? So we can just kind of go in that same order. Suzanne, if you want to go first. Well, um, usually I find opportunities through OVET. Um, also through, I have recently have gotten on to something called CAFE and looking at that. Um, but I don't apply that often, and partly it's because, I, well, because of number one, what I do, it's embroidery, so that takes a minute. And um, just have to be very choosy about, I just stay, I have stayed local, I mostly stay in Oklahoma, uh, maybe in o Tulsa. I don't go too far out the state or out the main cities. Um, and again, that's just because of time, energy, finances, because they all want some sort of entry fee. Um, but I am trying to spread out regionally. I'm, I'm, I've learned to be very choice that, you know, I can't do a shotgun approach with this. It's very hard. Jeffrey, can, can you speak to? Yeah, and uh, kind of following up on what Suzanne said, um, just while off the top of my he head, um, I think it is important to be uh, choosy or specific. So um, I think, you know, a lot of us, you know, as artists, we always want the next biggest thing, right? So you see this great opportunity, right? And you're like, oh man, I want to take that next step. But maybe that next step really is like 12 steps, but you just can't hesitate, but try and apply. And I think that's great. And we all have to do that. We all do do that. But I think you really need to be specific about finding the opportunities that fit kind of what you're doing or where you're at. Um, and so that's kind of that's kind of where I've had some success lately. Um, let me just back up a little bit. Um, so I originally started applying to things with OVAC uh, more than a decade ago. Um, and there was lots of great opportunities with OVAC in several different uh, methods and um, with open calls that I think are, are wonderful here in the community for sure. Um, and then more recently, I have used, um, I've used CAFE a lot to apply, and I forget actually, but I've, I've over the past couple of years, I actually have had three uh, shows that I got in through CAFE that were actually more traditional with um, traditional black and white photography. So that's actually much more like if you were a painter or a photographer or a two-dimensional artist. Um, and so I did have some luck there. I, I probably applied to... I don't know, 10 photography shows and got in three uh, um, across the country um, in different states. Um, and they are frustrating, like Suzanne said, they, they have entry fees. So some of them are $20, some of them are $35. Unfortunately, in the high-end photography world, it seems like all these people are retired, you know, and they have, some of them are really expensive. Some of them are like $85 or they're like $65 plus a $10 for every additional, uh, Entry. And so, yeah, I think you do have to be very specific and, and uh, tailor your submission to what you think you have the best chance of getting in, uh, just also financially, but also just to focus your interest. I think you really got to focus your energy. Um, and then more recently, I do um, my installations. Uh, luckily, uh, installation art and public art, almost 100% of the time, there's no entry fees involved, um, as far as I found. And so, I've applied to several through CAFE, um, which I've, uh, I've gotten at least one. I, I, I had a show at a science museum uh, that was uh, 
from best from December 2019 until recently in March. And I actually got it through Cafe, through an open call, um, which didn't have an entry fee, I don't believe, or maybe it was a real minor entry fee. Um, and then I do a lot of Googling. So there's other sites. Um, there's like publicartist.org and it's kind of a listing and uh, you sign in and sometimes you submit through that site or sometimes you submit, uh, it just points you to the specific website of the community or the, the venue. Um, and those are real specific because you, a lot of them, you don't actually have a, uh, it's kind of, cafe is nice or submittable, which OVAC uses a lot is nice because it has all the, the forms and the fields. But a lot of the um, other ones, you actually have to compile your own. Maybe they give you a template with a lot, you know, they say, well, you put your artist statement here and then you put your project statement here and you, um, but they're very tricky. So you have to really, you have to read it through like 20 times and figure out, make sure you don't make any mistakes. Because I did make a mistake this past, uh, about six months ago where I did the whole thing and I forgot to also, you had to submit them a PDF and then you also have to submit the individual photos so they can like jury them through a slideshow and, and so I got disqualified from that one. Um, and it's unfortunate. And the, you don't hear about that till the end. So, you know, three months later or whatever, they're like, oh, by the way, you got rejected. And we didn't even look at your stuff because you made, you know, you didn't, you messed up the last little bit of whatever you did. Um, so a lot of, so, and then I do some Googling. For me specifically, I'm doing a lot of um, temporary public art. And so I actually Google temporary public art opportunities. Um, and I get a bunch of sites uh, that are from, like community. So like, uh, there, you know, there might be one from Oklahoma or there might be an OVAC page. And then OVAC actually lists a bunch of opportunities even outside of o Oklahoma. And so I actually look at a bunch of pages for like, a bunch of different states, like arts organizations pages. And like they randomly, like I cobbled together sort of all these random opportunities uh, through there. Cause some of them you won't find in, some of them are harder to find. Like they won't all, they're kind of hidden a little bit sort of, or um, hopefully that was what I was supposed to say. Yep. That was perfect. Uh, <laughs> Kyle. Yeah, um, I, I tend to apply to around, uh, it depends on the year and, and where I am in my work, um, but around, you know, 15 to 20 uh, shows or opportunities. Um, if I include residencies in that, maybe it's a, a, probably a little higher. Um, and late, last couple of years, I've been really focused on residencies because I find that they really energize me. Um, and um, because I'm a professor, I, I have summers off and I, I'm lucky enough to be able to go to those uh, residencies. Of course, this year, <laughs> there weren't any residencies really going on. Um, but um, so yeah, a lot of residency applications. I, I tend to find opportunities in lots of different ways. Social media has been really helpful. You know, Facebook and Instagram, um, just seeing people post opportunities, um, different organizations posting opportunities friends recommending me opportunities and then seeing what they're doing and saying, oh, well, let's see more about that. Um, looking at the websites for what they're doing. Um, so yeah, the, multiple ways. Um, there's also great websites like um, artdeadline.com, which compiles, you know, like a national registry of, of opportunities for artists and different types of artists. And you can kind of filter um, the results from your search, uh, really helpful. Um, yeah, it, I, I, I tend to, it, I think most of, of the things that I do end up applying for are recommendations from artist friends. And I, I think that it's just been such an important part of, of my practice is building a community of artists who I share with. Um, and, you know, it's a reciprocal thing. They, they share with me, I share with them. And, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's not a competitive, fierce thing with, with uh, the, the community. And we just try to help each other. And, uh, I think um, that's really important. Yeah, I've had that experience too, where friends would share opportunities for me that was like, there's a call for entry for the show that is exactly what you're working on. You know, you should apply. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's great. So let, let's dive into uh, the worst part of it, rejection. How do you personally handle rejection? Has that changed throughout your career? Has it gotten any easier? And what are what are some tips or ways to um, to to deal with that part of of what inevitably is the process of applying for for opportunities? Yeah, Suzanne, you can jump in, or it can be more oh. conversational. Whoever wants to <laughs> okay. jump in there, yeah. Well, I handle it better than I used to. Rejection, um, but that's just. I don't know. Um, 
you know, I, I guess uh, the best thing I can say, how, you know, how do I personally handle it? I really have tried not to take it personal too much. And if, if I am reject, I mean, if I am, I am, I have been rejected for shows and try not to, I mean, I just try to be an adult about it. Understanding that this is, this is the game. I mean, I, and, you know, this is what we do. This is the game. Not a so not everybody thinks we do. Um, uh, I've just, you know, if I'm getting more rejections than acceptance, then I'm going to have to take a step back because it is, it does hurt so badly. And so, um, and look at what I'm doing, be honest about putting out there. Um, so that's easy. So I don't, like I said, I don't do the shotgun method of applying for shows because, you know, if I put 10 rejections back, well, that's going to hurt a lot. So to, I don't know how to put it up. I just have to do my research. And if I get in, I get in. If I don't, I don't. I do believe in going to, if I have an opportunity to actually go to the show or to go to those and see what got accepted. That helps. I, I, I can't tell you how much that really helps. And once you get, once you get out of your feelings, you know, get out of your feelings. And then if you can go to the show, I mean, I say 24 works. I didn't do it this year, but I, I've tried for 24 works. I've yet to make it, but I go to the show I go okay well all right I see. so uh and that that helps and it and you know either me they're going to decide does that make sense maybe I shouldn't do 24 works on paper or I just need to just yeah just make that decision that until you know maybe these next maybe I just need to take some time and just not do that go to the show learn play around and then let's see what happens and so um that's that's how i did it but usually literally it was a matter of just uh i'll uh just uh what, can I, what i'm trying to say just a matter of just getting out of my feelings and just going trying maybe taking a year or two off and not applying for anything i that did happen i just didn't do anything for a while uh, only, I mean, I always showed work, but always by invitation. Somebody will ask me to be a part of it. And that's nice. That's validating. Um, but, you know, and that, that helps. Happen. Don't poo-poo the invites you to be a part of a, of a show. Those are just as important, too. And they're just as affirming. Suzanne, do you also want to talk about... Um you know, we all kind of met on Monday to kind of talk oh. through this and kind of get it going. And one thing you mentioned was the opportunities that you've had to jury. Yeah. Um, well, when I took those couple of years off, like I said, I, I, I did. I was on a um, hundred years ago. I was on the visual arts committee at IAO. And that kind of helped a lot. And that is when you're on the other side of that, of that ball, when you're the one who's having to decide and say yes or no, then you, that's how you don't take it personal anymore. So my, I always recommend for anyone starting out, you know, cause I teach and I have students is, and I just say, if you, I don't care if you, if your high school art teacher calls you and says, Hey, I want you to judge the student art show of se graduating seniors, do it because that's hard. It is very difficult to do that. And that starts, and hopefully what happens is that you see what they're doing, what the other people are doing, and that really kind of helps to put a, what do we call a barrier, some sort of uh, objective in you. So when you do get rejected, you figure out you really don't take it personal because you get it. You know, if a juror or a curator or whatever, they're looking at 100, 200, 300, and so on. That's a lot of work for one or two human beings to go through. And so if you ever get that opportunity, do that for a while and it will make your entries stronger, but it will also help you not take the rejection so personal. And, and I, I would just add to that through my own curatorial practice mm -hmm. or when I've done jurying too, uh, sometimes it's not even about the quality of the art. It's all really strong art and it's about what 
artworks go well together? What's the story that that curator is trying to tell? And it could be that, that your work was even more exceptional than the other works, but it didn't fit in with that narrative that that curator was trying to tell. Uh, and also there's, there's personal taste, you know? Uh, there is a lot of it that is subjective too. Um, just one little story and then I'll, I'll pass it to Jeffrey was, we recently heard a story from someone who was talking about, um, it was a, an artist market and there was an artist who was on the waiting list. So one set of jurors had selected all the artists for the market, this artist was on the waiting list, someone dropped out, that artist was able to go in and then another set of jurors picked them for best of show. So how are they first not in the top, you know, however many, but then ended up getting, you know, the best award. So, so just kind of keep that in mind too, of sometimes it's, uh, it's the roll of the dice with curators and jurors and not really knowing, you know, sometimes you can do research and to see what, what other things have they curated or what is their own personal research in. Um, but even then it's still just kind of, kind of guessing. Um, but just wanted to add that. So, so Jeffrey, what are some ways that you cope with or, or deal with rejection in, in your work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I just want to say, um, I think this is a great topic for us all to be talking about. Uh, I think rejection impacts us all heavily. Um, I think it's hard for, I mean, I think all of us as artists are understand, but uh, someone who wasn't an artist, right, if they're all they're used to is kind of applying for jobs once in a while, you know, and maybe they have a job for years and they, you know, then they apply for four to get a thing, you know, to get a job, you know, they have to understand, you know, this kind of getting beaten down. If you're applying to a lot of stuff, you're, getting, you're possibly, potentially getting beaten down a lot. Um, and, and it's hard for everybody. Um, and everybody deals with it different ways. Um, personally, um, you know, how I deal with it is I try to take things from it. I don't take it personally. Uh, you know, when I think there is a difference between local and stuff that's not local. So when you're applying something local, it's potentially, you know, even who the juror, there might be a single juror, uh, a curator or a juror, and you know who they are, right? And so then when you get rejected from that, that can, I think that's, it's easier to take that one personally, you know, uh, not that you should, but I think, uh, and I've had that personal experience because I've known several, um, I've been rejected from shows uh, by uh, jurors who knew me very well and, and were very supportive of my art. And, you know, I think, you know, and I've talked to them about it later and they, I think potentially, you know, maybe the idea wasn't that great. Um, and plus I didn't present it, you know, I didn't maybe take the time you know, to present it right. Um, you know, so there are things to learn from that. But I think that's very, that is difficult, you know, when you're in your own community um, and you experience rejection people you know. So on the flip side of that, um, most of the stuff I applied for recently, um, it's for stuff who I don't, I don't know these people. Um, and there's not even a potential, a lot of the public art stuff, um, temporary public art, other things I'm doing, um, you don't know even who your who the juror is, you know, and potentially there's a whole committee of people, you know, um, doing the jury and you'll never know who they are um, or they, they maybe list who they are. Um, but, and so it's a little easier, I think, not to take those so personally, um, you know, and I think, and a lot of those um, that are, if there are shows that are um, getting, ex you know, submissions from across the country, hopefully you realize that they're very competitive. And so you don't take that too personally. Um, I don't really think you should um, ever really take them personally. Um, you know, I, I mean, it's hard. I think we all do. And even, uh, even when I have a lot going on, um, you know, and I get a rejection, for, even if I don't have to put a lot of time into it, if I'm applying the same, you know, installation across the several shows. Um, and so I have to make minor modifications. Maybe it only takes me an hour or two to apply to a show. Um, yeah, I mean, after I get my rejection, yeah, I'm, you know, want to go get a milkshake or something for sure. Um, you know, it, it, it's just, it's human nature, you know, and it's obvious we all put our hearts into it for sure. Um, but I think you all try to learn things from, you know, um, from the rejections. And, and I do think like, um, uh, like Suzanne was saying, you know, you go to the show, you know, you try and do your research. So when I'm applying to something that's a light art festival, I'm going back through the archives online on their website and looking at all what they accepted the years previously, um, trying to see what they, um, what they're looking for. And that's not really even to tailor what, what I'm doing to them. It's really to see if they're looking for what I'm doing, you know, um, and then in some ways, if I'm going to tailor anything, it's to tailor the way I present it, you know? And so I, if I'm, if, if I'm, if I can see that they're looking for more, uh, really heavily conceptual stuff, I'll spend more time elaborating conceptually. Um, but if I see they're clearly, uh, really fascinated with uh, shiny photos, well, then I'm going to make more time to make renderings or take photo documentation, send them photo documentation to try and, um, get my idea across them better. Um, if that makes sense.
Yeah, and I think you bring up a, a great question that maybe we can circle back to later is the question of, do you make the art for the show or do you find the show for the art uh, as another approach and way of looking at it? Um, yeah, and I, I, I don't believe you. It's hard. I think we all want to like, you know, like I said, kind of said earlier, you know, you get this, you see something online, a call for entry of any sort, right? Whether it's a, um, whether you're a painter and it says they're looking for the type of paintings, you know, and then you, right, do you say, oh, that's a great opportunity. I need to make a whole new painting right now that I never thought of because it fits this thing they're looking for, you know, put all this effort into it. Or do you say, no, that's not what I'm currently been working. That's not my current 12, you know, 12 ways I'm already working. You know, I need to find a show that fits one of the 12 ways I'm already working. And what I'm trying to do, which is hard to do, is I'm trying to disregard all the stuff that I'm, you know, just chasing and only apply to things that already fit uh, concepts or ideas or methods that I'm already trying to focus on. And it's hard because we all want the next great opportunity, you know, whether it's in a gallery show or wherever. But I think it's personally best to try and not tailor your art. Rather, but I mean, but it, but it's hard to say that because, you know, um, I think it's great and artists should all try and different, you know, take their concepts and really their art to different mediums. So it's really kind of semantics about it. You know, uh, you know, if you're a painter and there's a great opportunity for an installation and you, you c come up with an idea that translates to what you're already trying to convey, then I think you should go for that. And I don't think that's really tailoring your art to someone else. I think that's finding how your art speaks in a different medium, you know. Yeah, I think that's that's great advice. Otherwise, maybe you end up with, you know, 13 new works of art that weren't accepted in those shows, but don't actually make sense with what you were working on before. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Kyle, how, how do you cope with the rejection? Um, well, it's, it, 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 it's gotten easier uh, <laughs> as I've gotten rejected more. Um, I, I, and I talk to students a lot about it too. And I, one thing I remember doing when I was starting out as a student, um, and the, what I see my students go through too, is they tend to put all their eggs in one basket. You know, that first big application they want to do, um, you know, they work tirelessly on it, which it's, a, it's all a great thing. It's a learning experience. Um, and then ultimately get rejected. And then they're just devastated because it was just all this work for this one thing, this one opportunity they really wanted. They envisioned themselves in it and they, they saw themselves getting it and then they don't. And I, I remember going through that and it's, it's kind of something I think all artists have to, to go through. Um, but, you know, the, the more you do it, the more you learn to kind of just deal with it and just let it pass through you, not to take it personally. Um, but I always tell uh, students and I try to keep in mind myself and it, it's always it's it's a challenge and it's a, a continuing struggle it's just to take solace in well I did my best I I, I I put my best self out there and didn't work but I know that I I did my best and that in that way you can kind of avoid uh, being too harsh on yourself and beating yourself up too much um, but um, yeah putting all your eggs in one basket the more and more you do it, the more, you know, I think the common experience is, uh, that I experience at least, is, you know, waking up to your phone, you get an email, and, and it's from the institution that you, or gallery you applied to, and you're like, okay, here, here it comes. Your heart starts racing, and you, you look at those opening lines of, um, thank you so much for providing your application. Uh, and then, you know, oh, okay, this is kind of generic sounding. It's not, it's not celebratory right in the beginning. I probably didn't get this. Uh, and you just learn, you, you know, you can kind of laugh it off. And, um, and you know, it stings in the moment. Uh, but then, you know, you know, sometimes I just have to, you know, blow off some steam, take a walk, um, go exercise or, uh, you know, call a friend. Um, let it let it pass through me and eventually it does i mean it like clockwork if it if it's something you know i really wanted and it stings for a whole day within the next day or two it, you know i'm not even thinking about it at this point um now the different i think things that i've applied to uh in, in different ways you have to apply to things you know hurt in different ways you know it, i think the ones that have hurt me the most are the ones where i've had to go up and do like a public uh, presentation of my work, sometimes standing in front of my work, and uh, and state my case for for some of these competitions I've done, and you know that you're really putting yourself out there. Then it's not just you know sending an application by email and 
uh, saying good night. You're, you're up in front of people and you can see them responding to what you're saying in real time. And, um, and those, those can really hurt sometimes. Uh, but again, I, I try to take solace in, you know, okay, I, I tried my best. I prepared for this thing. And then be happy for, if you know the person who won, be happy for them and, and be supportive and, uh, you know, um, yeah, be generous and, and supportive. That, that is really the key. Um, this, all this, um, you know, putting your, your best self forward. Uh, I just read this book uh, over uh, this summer here. Uh, it's by Don Miguel Ruiz. It's called The Four Agreements. Um, and it's a, a Toltec wisdom book. And The Four Agreements, I'll just read them very quickly. Um, in their brief uh, little descriptions, but that's where always do your best. He, that's the fourth agreement. But the first one, these are just you know general ways to live, um, and I, I think it's really helpful uh, for an artist to read. It's a really quick and easy read. Uh, the first one: be impeccable with your word. You know when you're when you're applying to things and just being honest. Um, don't take anything personally. I, we've been talking about that. Don't make assumptions. You know don't assume that. You know, your work is terrible just because you didn't get this opportunity. Uh, there's lots of different things at stake and it's very complicated. And then always do your best. And, and it's a way to, to uh, avoid self-abuse, regret, and uh, beating up yourself too much. So. I, I think that's great advice. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, and Haley put a link to the book in the chat if anyone wants to look at that more closely. Uh, Kyle, I think you also mentioned support group. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I, I mean, like I said in the beginning, you know, the way I, I, I find that I've, I move through the world is by uh, relating to, to uh, different artists um, and uh, getting to know them and their work, and it happens naturally. Um, and, you know, it, the art world is a very competitive place. Any creative endeavor uh, is, is competitive and it's fierce and there's so many good artists out there. Um, but what's really helped me uh, in, in my career and in my life in general is just having, you know, a group of, of artist friends who, uh, who support each other and, um, and we're generous with each other. And that has to do with, you know, giving each other opportunities. You know, if you get something, you know, how can you help out someone you also think deserves something as well. Um, and then it also has to do with, you know, the application process. I have lots of different friends who are fantastic in different facets of uh, different parts of an application. So I, I know I have a friend who I send artist statements to. In artist statements, as, as everyone knows, that's just an ongoing thing that is never finished. <laughs> it's just yeah, you write one one month, and then the next you have to you have to throw it out and start over. Um, so I have a friend I send artist statements to. Um, I have a friend who's really good at uh, choosing like the order of the slides for your portfolio. She's fantastic in that, so I always ask for advice uh, on that sort of thing. You know, the C, the, the cover letter, and all that. Oh yeah, it's just never ending. But I, I, I have friends and I, and they send me their stuff too. It's definitely easier. Uh, I, I, find, I, I have a hard time writing artist statements and, and cover letters. It's very difficult for me, but I'm really good at looking at other people's. It's uh, because I can, you know, you've got objectivity and, and uh, it, it's much easier. So uh, yeah, and it's a process, you know, you, you, you're always fine tuning these things. I have a folder on my laptop that have that has all of my application materials dating back from you know maybe even ten years ago, and I can see you know where I was at back then with my statement and uh, you know I, I date each statement and each iteration so uh, I, I can kind of keep track of things and the, the latest one uh, so it's an ongoing process and then um, you know to not be envious of people who do get things. That can be, it could be tricky. It's, it's, you know, it's kind of built in us to be like, well, why did so-and-so get that opportunity and I didn't, you know? And, hmm, um, you know, it, it, you have to just kind of realize, well, they do the work they do, I do the work I do. It's really a competition 
with with yourself more than anything. Um, you 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 have to put <laughs> petty jealousy aside sometimes, even though you, you know it happens to everybody, and just be you know, supportive and happy for other people and their accomplishments. Uh, because, you know, if you get something you want, people to be happy for you too. It's reciprocal. Um, so, yeah, generosity and, and, and support are, are everything <laughs> in, in, in terms of being an artist. Um, I, I find that, you know, in, in terms of my grad school uh, uh, experiences and uh, in working with different institutions, it's the people that really matter. Uh, that's what I really get out of it. My, my relationships with other people. And um, uh, that's what propels you. So, yeah, your reputation is very important. Being reliable, being professional. That, that all goes hand in hand with, with, with your art practice. Uh, can I also say, I think you also have to know what it is you want to do ultimately. I mean, if you want to be a full-time practicing artist, then you have to approach applying and all of that differently. But if you have some, I mean, if it's, I don't do a lot of applying for shows, but that's not how I saw my art career anyway. Right. I mean, I want to be in shows. Of course, I want to sell work. But I think that also makes a difference. You have to decide what is, what do you want your career, your life as an artist to look like? And then govern yourself accordingly. And so that's part, you know, the being genuine, being the best of who you are and all of this. Because I think what happens a lot of times, people, like I said, they just try for everything and they haven't sat down and really thought, okay, this is what I want out of being an artist. And it's okay for you to want certain things and to say, this is what I want my career to look like. This is, you know, at least for now, we all know that can change over time. But um, I think that's part of also, so when you are ready to do those shows and get those rejections, no matter what, you're at least, you know, you have to feel like you're moving in some sort of direction. I, I think that's great advice. And I think also writing it down. Uh, it kind of goes hand in hand with with your business plan or or your vision plan for your career. Um, you know, do you want to be someone like Kyle who's who's going from residency to residency and working with the community or with the resources at that residency? Or do you want to, you know, have a lot of exhibitions? And um, and then I think also it's really about just putting yourself out there. And when you get a rejection, um, it, in some ways, I, I think it could be a positive thing of just saying, well, at least you put it out there and somebody saw your work and it might not have fit in with this show, but maybe it will fit into another show somewhere else down the line. Um, and, and I think also when, when curators start seeing the same work come up over and over again, uh, sometimes by the third time, you know, they might be like, oh, I, I need to look more into this artist and what they're doing because, you know, I keep seeing their work coming up. So. Uh, so sometimes a rejection is not even a full rejection. It's a not right now, uh, but maybe later. So I think that's just another way to look at it. That's helpful for me anyway. Um, so I was wondering if any of you had a personal story about rejection and maybe something that, uh, that it taught you about your work. Yeah, uh, Kyle, uh, he reminded me of a, a epic rejection I had received, which I think is worthy. I mean, uh, I'm great at being rejected. So uh, a couple years ago, uh, I applied for a public art thing locally and um, opportunity uh, with a with a artistic partner. And uh, there's a long process. You know, you have to uh, you have to submit it in uh, hard copy. Oddly enough, some of these things are like you know you may have to make ten copies of this whole thing and like get them stapled and bound. And and so you you submit those and you know then you wait a month and then you hear back okay you're shortlisted. And so then you go make one presentation you know to one group of people. And you make it next and you're like, well, okay, you're down, there's down to two people, two different groups, and uh, you present to the Arts Council. And so I went down to present to the Arts Council, and we both made our presentations, and then literally they decided three minutes later, right in front of all of us. Like, like so that, yeah, they're like, oh no, we got the other guy, or whatever, you know, and so you're just standing there, right? You just made your presentation, you've been waiting like, you know, two months. And, like, they're not even like, they're like deliberating with like you standing there in the room. Like, um, so that's pretty epic. 
Um, and then, um, and so it's hard, right? In person, right? Pretty hard um, and hard to deal with. But you know, you're saying, and, and you know, um, it works out. But then also, what I forgot to mention, which kind of goes along with that, is um, uh, there's kind of a different experience also when you're shortlisted and then you get rejected. So you've gone through and and that's um, a lot of times when you get to a certain uh, point in your career, or what, or and especially if you're re being very focused on what you're applying to. Um, I mean, I'm shortlisted on half the things I applied to, probably. You know, and does that make me feel better necessarily than when I'm rejected from almost all of them? I don't know. Not really. You know, um, you know, it's still just as hard, I think, um, and sometimes harder maybe because you. Um, Usually there's a second step, you know, so, you know, you get shortlisted down to however many and then, you know, they need more information. Either that's just another submission online or whether that if it's something local, a uh, curator comes by and meets you. Um, and so and those are great connections to make. And I think that um, I think this stuff does come around um, for sure. I was shortlisted for um, for something uh, last year and then the uh, Arts Council in that city uh, contacted me recently before the COVID breakout. And we're talking about actually having that installation they didn't actually choose, but for a longer period of time. And so I think that that stuff does um, does for sure come around. Um, and then just uh, briefly, um, uh, specifically with what I do, um, I've been submitting the same installation to several different shows of kind of temporary public art that involves light art or interactivity, and they're all very specific. And so um, in the past year, I sent the exact same installation off to uh, five places and they're all looking for the exact same things. Uh, they're all accepting several installations um, They all have similar budgets um, And out of the first four I submitted I only got picked for one which I was very grateful for is great opportunity um, and I was essentially um, Kind of shortlisted for the others. So they you know, I had phone calls with them, you know, and they had some of them told me why they didn't think it fit right, you know, necessarily um, some of them didn't tell me that um, but I think that kind of goes to show that you know, even if you know, you get rejected, it really doesn't necessarily mean a reflection on your work in any way, shape, or form, um, you know, because it's the exact same, they're looking for the exact same thing, all these different groups of people, you know, and, and one of them chooses it, and three others say, no, we don't think it fits quite, you know, with, um, you know, with the show they're having, you know, um, so I think you always have to kind of keep that in mind that, um, you know, there are personal tastes, you know, and just it doesn't fit with the grouping, or they already may already have you know, uh, three works of art that really kind of cover what area you're doing or what concept you're exploring that they already uh, have decided to include. Yeah, Kyle or Suzanne, do either of you have a personal story of rejection to share? Um, yeah, um, I, I, uh, Jeffrey's uh, example reminded me of, of something in at the end of grad school, you know, there was a big um, award that everyone knew about. You know, the, the whole two years of of, uh, of grad school, everyone's kind of like, okay, we want we want to win this. It was like ten thousand dollars, and and this is actually one where I had to to speak in front of people. And um, yeah, I was I was one of the three finalists, and, and the three finalists were. Uh, my, my friend, they're all, we're all really good friends and uh, really supportive of each other. And I, you couldn't be two nicer people who deserve, deserve the, the award. Uh, so we all do our thing. And um, uh, Natalia, who, who got the award, gets a call from uh, the Dean to go into the office. And um, she goes and they, they tell her she, she won. And, um, and Natalie is, is the sweetest, nicest person, an amazing artist. She totally deserved to win. And, and uh, the director tells her, well, now you have to tell the others. <laughs> they made her tell us that she won, <laughs> which is horrible. Uh, I can't imagine doing that to someone. And she, so she went across the street to the studios and told us, and she, she was crying, <laughs> telling us that she won and, you know. Of course, she deserved it and everything. Um, so that, that that's one story that comes to mind. It, you know, it was such a supportive group, um, and um, she actually ended up giving us uh, uh, some money from her, from her winnings. I mean, that's how great of a group it was. I mean, you can make with with these opportunities. You know, you can make things happen. Um, and you know she was in a better financial spot than than we were, and boy did that uh, the money she gave me help me live through the summer in Boston because 
uh, grad school is like, it can be, unfortunately, a dead end where, you know, okay, what do I do? I just spent two years working in a studio and now I have to go back into, into reality. Um, you know, she allowed me to stay in my apartment and uh, have some time to, to get other work. But again, support of your community is, is, is uh, the uh, moral of the story. Uh, an another example, that's a similar time. Um, I, uh, I had applied to uh, the Star Fellowship at, at the Royal Academy in London. Uh, and the story that I had heard over and over is that at, at BU, every other year, one student was selected from BU to, to, to do this, this fellowship. And not many people in my class applied. And you know, I was thinking, okay, I'm, I'm a shoe in for this. Um, and this was such an extensive portfolio that this doesn't happen much anymore, but I actually had to send a packet and everything and ship it to, to London. And um, I really thought I would get it. I, I talk about putting a lot of your eggs in one basket. I was just counting, counting on it. And um, the whole summer, I didn't even hear a response from them. From them, that and that happens sometimes with these these applications. They don't even get back to you and say that you didn't get it. And it became kind of a running joke throughout the summer. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to London. You know, I just haven't heard back. They're still, uh, you know, making their final decision. I've got to be in the, you know, the final three. Never heard back from them. Um, so that, yeah, that's something that happens with rejection. You just don't hear, which can be really frustrating. Um, I don't necessarily have one story uh, of rejection um, other than, and <laughs> it's really not art related, but I was up for an award and uh, I didn't get the award twice from my uh, school where I work. And, um, and I, you know, I'm so meticulous. I mean, I try to be meticulous when it comes to art, but for whatever reason, I just wasn't, I was being creative when I was applying for this particular award. Um, and so how that impacted me is that I just knew I had to pay more attention, give them what they want. And when I was in graduate school, I actually got a fellowship. It's not, this is not about someone else wanted the fellowship and how they reacted kind of had an impact on me more when I got it. I mean, I was very happy, I knew, and this, it really hurt a lot. This person was, I thought, a good friend. We had a good conversation. He didn't talk to me. He didn't look, I mean, that went on. And then he stopped, and then, you know, it really hurt. And then I just was like, so I, and then, you know, all of a sudden he was the victim. And so, um, like, uh, and that sounds weird, but it, it, that impacted me too, because what he had, you know, he had said something in remarks and I just felt the only reason why he thought I got it was for, you know, because I'm a black woman. Uh, that's why he thought I got it. And that has definitely impacted me and whenever I get stuff. I didn't even think that way, at, you know, young and naive as I was. But, um, how he reacted to the how he reacted to being rejected had it impacted me at that point in a way you know i have to make sure you know that if ever the if ever it's the reverse and it has been i wasn't going to do that i just so yeah I, that's that's kind of how i feel that how i didn't necessarily change my work but it changed how i felt when i did feel rejected that i did not want to be that guy and behave like that and so I hope and I haven't I don't I have and I really honestly have not I don't think so so something that we kind of touched on throughout but what are what are some tips that you have on how to not get rejected like there's all of these things outside of our control the curator's aesthetic specifically what the curator is looking for um, but what, what are some things that you can control uh, that can help you not get rejected over something small that you could change? Suzanne, do you want to start up? Yeah, so I'll start. Yeah. Uh, well, what Kyle's been saying with Jeffrey is definitely um, 
be sure to, I mean, do as much research as you can, especially if it's an annual show, if it's an annual thing, because a lot of us do, you know, there's a lot of those annual, biannuals, you know, triannuals, I think that's a word, um, things that happen. And so always want to look at past of what happened, you know, what kind of work archive that and just make sure that, uh, and of course, look at the curator, the juror, you know, read their bio. If you get an opportunity to look at some of the other things that they have uh, done or the works they have looked at, there is that. And the other thing is your images are so important. Um, uh, I think we were talking and I said, I know a lot or you know, and I own a lot too, but, um, I, I just think you do better with an actual camera and you can manipulate it and uh, um, and also always have someone read, always have a proofreader, always have a proofreader. Uh, I, uh, I cannot stress that enough. Make sure that whoever, you know, they don't have to be the world's best, you know, they have to know how to read and they, and you have to make sure that whatever it is you're writing, whether it's a proposal or your artist statement, that it makes sense to someone who's, you know, who's reading it. Like they don't know who you are because this curator doesn't have any idea who you are nine times out of 10. And so you better make sure that whatever it is you're saying makes sense to anybody who has not a clue about who you are. And so that's, those are the best thing. I think a lot of times when I read some of the statements and I'm like, okay, you did not have anybody else read this. You just sat down hammered this out and then, you know, and then you didn't have anyone. And I'm kind of a grammar Nazi too. I don't sound like it, but I am. And that is, you know, I, I you know, <laughs> gotta put the period in there. That And that does, that does count. That's, this, it, it does, that's important. You know, make sure that you're, you know, that you at least, you know, that it, it shows that you're, when you take that time, it just shows, I think to the, anybody who's reading it, that you care, that you double check and you, and you are a pro professional, you know, that you take this seriously. Yeah, Jeffrey, what, what do you have to add to that? Yeah, um, so I was just thinking actually of a, of a non-rejection that actually kind of worked out like unusually. So the first thing I ever uh, got a couple of years ago, or almost three years ago now, uh, that was outside the state of, far outside the state of Oklahoma through an open call, through a uh, um, call for entry. I actually found it last minute. I was, I, I was at work and I was uh, searching through call. I hadn't looked at call for entry in probably months and months. And I, it was probably three or 4 p.m. And I found something, uh, a light art festival that I had an idea for when I looked through it all. And so I actually went home that night and did it all very, I, it was based on a concept I already had. So I already had the idea, you know, I'd been working on it for a long time, um, but it was the perfect opportunity. And so um, luckily I had everything prepared to do that. Um, and um, and I, it luckily uh, a lot of that stuff, especially a lot of stuff in call for entry, I think by default, a lot of it actually is either Pacific time deadline or California time deadline. Um, and so easy to use the time difference to give you a little bit extra time. But on the flip side of that, that's not how you should do it. So what I was going to say is you should always be looking as early as you can for everything, whether it's local opportunities mm -hmm. or uh, far away opportunities. So I try to always go through and look at least every week at all the opportunities I can find. And then I kind of keep a document of the ones I think I want to apply for. Um, and luckily, a lot of the ones I'm hope I'm doing actually are published quite well in advance. Like uh, there'll be uh, you know 60 days to apply for it or or something. Um, and then other ones you know when they're coming up. So um, one of the uh, opportunities I'm uh, in the process of being a finalist for right now that I'll hear back from in a couple of weeks. It was a festival that I chose not to apply for because I was uh, too focused on other things last year. And so I knew when it was going to come back around this year. So I'd already been uh, preparing for it essentially. Um, so that when it, the opportunity came around, I was already well prepared. Um, and so that goes into what Kyle was saying earlier about keeping your past submissions. So I have a, uh, like a Google Docs folder where I keep everything I submit to. So I have it all categorized by year and then by individual submission. And I use Google Docs to, um, to write everything out. And then if I submit everything, I make sure to save like a PDF copy in there exactly what I submitted. So even if I make a change um, to the Google Doc later, I make sure I know how exactly it was I submitted it. Um, and along with all the, uh, the, um, the documentation. So any photos I send in or videos, I make copies of them and put them in a Google Docs folder so I can go reference that years later. Um, 
and then that's how I make my, uh, my general artist statements also. So I'll copy the Google Doc for the artist statement over to a new folder, leaving the old one so I can make changes to the new one and always reference the old version. So I can see kind of how the, uh, the artist statement um, evolves or even the project statement. If, you know, a lot of us are gonna submit the same, you know, we have a great idea. And just because we rejected on that project once doesn't mean we're gonna throw that one out. So, you know, um, you know, I make several iterations over the you know, time period of several submissions of the same project to uh, refine it better after each rejection. Maybe, you know, you get more life experiences in between each thing. So, you, you know, even if the rejection itself didn't tell you anything, that time period hopefully has told you something. Maybe you've learned more about what you want to explore um, or picked up other skills along the way. Um, and yeah, I think uh, like Susan said, images, um, especially if you're submitting two-dimensional work, the images are extremely important, obviously. Like if you're submitting open calls and you're a painter or a photographer or uh, any number of or art where it's more based off of the scene, the art, rather than the conceptual write-up. Um, very important. I, I think o OVAC definitely has some uh, help. They do that with that sometimes where they um, allow you to come in and uh, if you're a member and they have someone help you or give you tips. Um, I know they do that in Tulsa as well, AHA, I believe. Um, so I think that's very important. Um, it's hard, you know, when you're an artist, you're like, well, I'm a painter. Why do I have to be a professional photographer also to get into a show? You know, why can't my like, you know, I have to master both painting and, photo and documentation to get in any shows. Like it seems unfair and it is unfair. Um, but unfortunately that's the nature of the world is the curious can't come to your studio and look at your art um, most of the time, you know, and see it for themselves. So you have to do your best job representing it um, to them. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think there's, I think a lot of times you can, um, other, otherwise you can find other artists who are really good at it and do work out trades with them, whether they're a photographer or not, maybe they're just a, an artist who's really got a great method for um, photographing their artwork, you know. And then there's lots of, uh, you know, help you can find online doing some Googling. Lots of people have all kinds of tricks. Lots of people, you know, really believe the best way to photograph a painting is to set it outside, kind of on a cloud, you know, when some cloud covers over, you know, and just take a snapshot of it outside. Other people, you know, go crazy in a studio. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's great. I I'll say whenever I'm jurying things that are online on submittable, because I'm a visual person and I want to see the art, I always go to the images first and then go back and read. Uh, because then you have that visual in your head as you're reading the documentation, but that literally is the first thing uh, that you look at. Yeah, and in the same, in the same way, when you're, if you're submitting like an installation, I think to be professional, if it's not really the images, you'd have to find your way to be professional in your, in your presentation all, all through. So whether it's the artist statement or your resume or how you're described, a lot of them will have different sections they want you to talk about, whether it's an installation in a gallery or in the public, they'll say, well, do you have any other technical needs? Or they want to make sure you've thought through everything, you know, thought through the problems they're going to have. So when they're juring for you, you know, the jurors, if there's multiples, they're going to be kind of picking the problems apart, right? Oh, there's no way that would hang in the gallery. There's no way that would. And so they want to see that you and as an artist have thought through some of these problems. So you want to try and be as professional as possible and thinking through those problems. And I think it, you can get help from other people. So, you know, you ask your artist friends or your family, hey, read this through. And if you were trying to think about how it would happen in a space, what questions would you have? And then you try and answer those questions as best you can in the submission. So they know you've thought it through. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, that's great. Kyle? Um, yeah, I think what, uh, what Jeffrey was saying about, you know, building kind of a repertoire of application materials, it, just, it gets easier and easier as you have more uh, things that you've written for different purposes that you can kind of take and, and, and choose and combine and rewrite and it, it, yeah, never ending process. Um, and then what, what Suzanne was saying about proofreading and uh, what, I, what I try to tell students, you can read your own writing a million times, but there's always something that you won't pick up on. <laughs> it's yep. inevitable. So yeah, have a, have a friend that, that's, that's good at proofreading. Um, yeah, um, yeah the, the process, it, it, yeah, I always, I always believe the, the work leads. Uh, you know, if, if you're an artist, you're passionate about your work. That's where th that, that's where things happen in, in your in your studio uh, or in your practice. Um, and like uh, the question that came up earlier, you know, do I do I uh, uh, adjust my work for specific applications? And um, I. I I, I'm of the mindset for my work. I do not. I, I don't really let it influence me at all, uh, and I, I don't really consider myself a commercial artist. I've never really thought of myself in that way. I'm much more interested in expanding uh, the concepts that I'm working with, 
Um, but the, yeah, the studio and, and the, the, the practice, that's where the work takes place and everything springs from that. Um, and just like, you know, your work develops, you, your work doesn't change in a day just because you think you, you need to, to change something for a certain, uh, to, to satisfy a certain audience. It's a, a gradual evolution uh, in, in the studio. And, um, you know, you may apply to something and you don't get it, um, but your work's just not there yet. And then, you know, the only thing you can do about that is just get to get back in the studio and keep working, working through it. Uh, you know, find your own voice. I think sometimes uh, what happens is that, you know, an artist may think they have to, they have to please everyone uh, as opposed to finding their own voice. Uh, and if you if you make work just to please other people, then you're not making the work you really want to make that doesn't come you know genuinely within you. Uh, and you're making work that may be derivative, which will get rejected anyway. <laughs> so I think the, the the better way to go about it is to just put put everything into the work. But then you you have to present yourself uh, well. It's like you know you build this Ferrari or something. Uh, but it doesn't have wheels. <laughs> the wheels are the are the thing that, that makes it move. Um, you know, my 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 practice is has changed a little bit since I moved to uh, to Alva out here. Um, you know, it's we're kind of in a remote area in north northwestern Oklahoma, so I, I, I don't get a lot of people in my in my studio. Um, so you know, I really rely on how I present my work digitally. And of course, you know, residencies have, have been really helpful for me too to kind of expand my uh my network and relationships but for the most part when you know when i'm here during the semesters i don't get a lot of foot traffic so you know documentation of my work is essential getting applications out there is essential do i like doing it no it's not my favorite part of <laughs> being an artist <laughs> i really dislike it um i i it's 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 one of the most difficult things to write about your work and 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 to, and it's frustrating that you know well, i'm making a huge painting here and it's going to be what people are actually, actually going to see is a small JPEG on a screen. Um, that, that can be frustrating, but that's just you just have to work with it and and, and know that you know things translate, and um, and, and and keep going for it. I, I had a professor uh, who always said, you know, applying for things is just part of it. You know, if you if you just say okay for an hour, even a half an hour a day in your in the studio just work on applications and then keep it at that. And then, you know, half an hour a day or an hour a day, is, is a, it, it adds up and over a long amount of time, you know, you'll get a lot out there. It's just part of the practice. Great, well, thank you so much. I, uh, I think we should go ahead and open it up to questions from all of you. Um, I know that on social media, we, did we pose the question of what what do you want to know about uh, the topic of rejection so we do have a couple questions that were submitted um, by people in this group or people that maybe couldn't make it that Haley is going to go through but while we work through those questions if you also have a question that you want to ask of our panelists either of a specific panelist or generally if you want to just put that in the chat um, then then we'll get to those in just a minute. So I'll go ahead and pass it back to, to Haley to work through our, our questions. Yeah, well, it's that was a great conversation because I think you guys actually touched upon quite a few that we had. Um, there are a few here that I think that you guys could touch upon as well. So um, the first um, I think we should discuss is uh, one of the person who submitted a question had submitted to a show um, and they had a confirmation, digital confirmation, and when they were asking to see um, how it was going, there was an issue that they didn't, um, <coughs> they said that they didn't receive it or, sorry, I'm trying to read the question while I'm talking about it, but um, they had sent out the notifications, but said they didn't see their application. Um, and I guess their question is, they obviously want to be professional. They don't want to um, come off as unprofessional or um, ungrateful for opportunities, but they kind of want to say, 
Like, what do you do in that situation? If you think something happened and you feel like you need to say something just to get clarification, um, how would you have reached out? Would you have reached out? Um, kind of, what would you have done? Um, it's complicated and um, it's part of that technology part of submissions these days, but um, yeah, I think you guys could give us some great insight into that. And just whoever wants to jump in would be great. It kind of seems like a little dubious on the, on the, on the part of it. It seems like the timeline kind of shows that they didn't look at the application, and, but they say they did, and there's not really a way to prove that they did. I think at best, maybe asking for a refund if, it, if there was a, a fee involved. I, I should add the, the questioner, the person asking the question, excuse me, said that they were late notifications due to the right. pandemic. So okay. the organization also obviously had issues, but um, right, you're supposed to, you know, kind of rise above the issues and work with what you have. So um, yeah, just to kind of clarify the questions. But I think that one's tough. I think first of all, as an artist, you should always do your best to research the what you're applying to, to make you, at least feel like the, you know um, it's uh, being put together by a group that um, is professional, um, so you don't get caught in a situation where uh, you feel like they're just trying to collect entry fees, sort of, and just throw some art in the wall, and that's their whole game, really, and not really uh, supporting art. You'll, if you're around much and do much submissions, I, you'll you'll find there's galleries across the country that are you can very well tell, and you can do some googling, and I've done googling before because I thought I was gonna maybe put a smart in a show somewhere uh, several years ago. And I, I found all kinds of crazy talks about this guy and, you know, about how, you know, he didn't really care about the art and, you know, you have to take that with a grain of salt, but I, I think it was a good idea not to even try and apply because, um, you know, uh, I talked to the guy, but not to apply because it he had a bunch of artists who clearly had some bad experiences where, uh, you know, um, but, you know, I think you got to kind of rise above all that though. And, you know, and, and so sort of what, um, you know, Kyle was saying earlier, I think you can't think of any submission as something you have to have, any, sure. you know, that you apply for, you know, there's, there's going to be lots of opportunities, hopefully for everyone, uh, everyone. Um, and really, that's kind of where the rejection really gets to be a problem, I think, is where you're really saying, oh, you know, I, this is the thing I need, you know, if I don't get this, well, then I'm going to move on. And I'm just going to, you know, never make another, you know, I'm gonna throw my art supplies, you know, um, I don't really think that's, I don't really think that give make makes you make better art, you know, to like, to really get that invested in individual submissions. You know, I think you need to invest yourself in your own art that, that deeply, but, um, you know, you know, you don't ever want to feel like when you get rejected for something that, you know, oh man, I really deserve that. You know, that was, you know, this is an injustice, you know, I, I don't personally, and everyone has different feelings, but personally, I don't believe that anyone really deserves anything, you know, like, I don't think that's a, a really a, a feeling you should really have under any circumstances. Like, it doesn't matter if you've been getting, you know, $100,000 installations, you know, and then you apply to a show that doesn't, you know, pay anything or whatnot, you know, and they reject your whatever. Like, I don't know that you really can say, oh man, I deserve that. Like, that's just, to me, that's not an attitude that really um, is going to get you anywhere, you know, personally. Like, I'm not saying get you anywhere externally or whatever, showing play, but I, I don't know that how that, you know, helps you you know, um, make art or, uh, or cope with rejection by feeling that, that um, personal about it, really. And I mean, I'll, obviously, we're, why we're here talking about it is because it, the rejection affects us all personally, obviously. Like, if we were all just robots, we wouldn't need to hear talk about it. You know, rejection would be nothing to us. But, you know, so it's definitely affecting all of us deeply. But we have to all do our best to realize that, unfortunately, rejection is part of it. You know, maybe a lot of it. A lot of it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, the question was asked by Chandler and she's just kind of clarifying that um, I think she respected their who they chose um, she just wanted to confirm that her materials were actually reviewed so um, is it professional to you know make that ask or um, you know you just got to kind of hope for the next go around and make sure that they get it next time you know like how far do you go um, well I mean, if, I guess it depends on, I mean, like we turn work in and you say, yeah, you did it. But if they send it on to whoever, there's a third, if there's a third party involved, if, you know, an independent juror, curator, whatever, 
they may not have looked at it. And that has, and, or I don't know, it's, it, and uh, there's a distinct, or it didn't get passed on. Uh, sometimes it's just good old fashioned human error. And it sucks. It sucks because in this case, you don't know one way or another but how to handle that. Um, I mean, you might, in my personal opinion, at that point, you just go, okay, um, sure, let's blame everyone. And um, I don't know, just, I mean, you might, I, I don't know if you're able to ask, are you sure it got to the reviewer? Was it, was it going to a third party or that sort of thing? But I don't know. It depends on how, how, how badly you, I mean, how badly you want to know. No, I think you definitely, if you submit via uh, like email where you need to make sure you get a confirmation from someone. I, think. Right. You know, I had that experience recently where uh, I didn't uh, get a confirmation and a week later, so I emailed and she goes, oh yeah, it was in my, you know, uh, spam folder. I didn't find it. And this is a significant, a very significant uh, show with a very significant, well, more than six figure budget for everything, you know, and I'm finals for it now, luckily. So I'm glad I obviously, uh, I reached out and shot a little email said, hey, do you get my submission? Um, but so I think that's kind of a little rarer because a lot of most of the stuff I think is generally through submittable um, or uh, call for entry. But um, I, I think you want to be professional. So and that's one way I think being fresh is if you don't hear back because you generally if you submit my email in my experience, you'll hear back in a couple of days. You'll get some sort of email either really fast say hey thank you for your submission you know uh, and they usually give you a timeline maybe well you know in a week or two or a month or two. Um, but if you don't hear back, I think it is good to, um, you know, reach out, but otherwise it's hard. Um, uh, one of the, the show I was recently in, in California, uh, at a, uh, science museum, um, is a long process. So I submitted through call for entry and actually didn't hear back for five months. Yeah. A real five months. And, you know, and they're like, Hey, you know, cause they're, they're working through artists. Right. And so I'm kind of a more of an emerging newer. And so, you know, they're, they're probably picking, you know, the more sure shots first, you know, and then finding slots for other people. Um, it's kind of a different thing. And they're filling a whole year, a calendar year at a time. And uh, so, you know, and then, it, and then it's a long process of negotiating contracts and this thing goes on. This, this whole show I just had recently a couple, a few months ago, but it, it was like a, it was about an 18 month process before, you know, from submission to the first day my show was, you know? Um, and so I, but that, but in that case, I never emailed them because it was all done through call for entry. So even though I hadn't heard back from them for a long period of time, um, and actually I hadn't heard back from a long period of time from a show I did in Napa, several years ago also, um, they had some uh, fires and so they thought that it wasn't gonna happen. And so um, they uh, didn't hear back from them for several months and then you get a call and say, hey, we're, still, we're gonna try to put this thing together, can you still do it? So it's hard to know, you know, I think you always have to decide, you know, for yourself, what would be, what's the most professional thing to do, you know? Yeah, I, I, I agree and I, I think it's pretty reasonable to, to to ask, uh, send an email and say, hey, did, did you get my, my application? Especially if it's past the date that they said they were gonna send out notifications. Uh, and I, I know I've, I've, received, I've received applications from the, uh, for the residency here, where because uh, you know, I'm using university email, some of the, the spam filters are weird and they go, sometimes they go to the, the spam folder and I don't see them. So there's been a couple where I, I did not see them and, um, I had to check the speed that you know, I got notified by the artist and, and then I looked. So definitely worthwhile doing. I know one thing that came up in our, in our meeting on Monday, you know, in, in terms of, you know, responding to uh, the, 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 uh, the institution, you know, when is it, when a good time is to ask if you were rejected, if, if it was a, uh, you know, why <laughs> you want reasons why you were rejected. <laughs> And I know, Suzanne, I think you had a, a good example. Oh yeah, there was a, yeah, yeah there was a, a show and it was when we were, I was still working uh, on the committee with the IO gallery. And actually the person got into the show, but they didn't win best of show, now that I remember it. And they contacted the juror uh, on and they were a little, belligerent it wasn't uh and the question was i mean i know that, that you know the, she went through
the, if, if the jury responded or not to this person, but we read the email that was sent to the juror. It wasn't, wasn't well, it was, I mean, it just wasn't, you know, kind of caught off guard and kind of like, you know, accusatory. So um, the thing is, you know, if you're going to do that, if you want, uh, number one, if you want feedback, go through the people who are organizing it. Yeah. Don't, uh, that was the big thing. It's like, you could have contacted us uh, and said, is there any way I can contact? And, you know, I would say, send it to me, I'll send it to the juror. You know, because it, 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 I just think, you know, that way you kind of keep that respect. I mean, I, 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 I think being a, you know, being a judge or a juror or any of that is like anything else. You want, you know, we want to kind of protect them. You know, they're doing us this thing. I mean, yeah, they may be getting a little bit of whatever, but, you know, I don't want to be angrily confronted by email or in person by someone going, why didn't you choose me? You know, no one wants to do that. And that doesn't look good for you. So, uh, if you, it, it uh, some, t uh, what I would suggest, if you want feedback and be prepared for what that feedback is, that's the other thing. Mm -hmm. It's great to ask for feedback, just be prepared for it. You might not like what they say, uh, but definitely always go through the, if, if, if it's a third, if it's a third party, like an outside juror, go through the people who are organizing it. Don't don't do that yourself because that you definitely will get a reputation there. <laughs> Depending on who it is and where it is. Like I said, this is IO Gallery, so as you can imagine, it's a very small community we're dealing with at the time. So So I think I think we're starting to get a little close to time, but mm -hmm. Haley, do you want to ask another um question from your list? Yeah, this one, um it's it's Part of a conversation that's been happening broadly across not just Oklahoma but the nation at large and someone on Instagram really wants us to touch upon it so I think we should try to do that here um, and just very briefly it's have you personally experienced racial discrimination in your artistic practice and how do you respond and overcome this um, when you're confronted with it um, Big question, hard for five minutes, but I think it's important to touch upon. Well, I'll take that. Comfortable. Uh, <laughs> I'll do. Um, well, yeah, uh, depending on, I mean, definitely, like I said, um, how do you overcome that? Uh, you I just keep making, how, how would you, how I've responded? Um, I just, um, I look at, again, you know, or maybe, and maybe do a little bit more research depending. I do look at who they showed before. I do, you know, if I am looking at art, I, I do specifically want to look at art that, uh, or shows. If I see the word black woman, feminist, yeah, I'm going to apply for those depending on, and again, there's some other things involved. Um, and I don't know how to, how would, I, I just keep doing it. Cause I, you know, I hate to say it, but it's kind of like, yeah, it's part of the, for me, it's, it's my life. It's my day. It's how I go through a lot of things. Like when I got the fellowship, I mean, it started with, I mean, I got a fellowship and I still had that racism come at me saying, oh, you only got it cause you're a woman because you're both. That's why I got the fellowship. And, uh, and that that was good news right uh so if you find that um i know the person sent a response uh that the person that they got from this uh individual it was a show in new york i guess i don't know the whole details how they responded um i kind of had problems with saying you know they're gonna uh, from what you can see like oh well you should look at black galleries high-end black galleries that's how they responded. Kind of was like, okay, that doesn't tell that person anything. It really doesn't. Um, because the question, I said, you know, and thank you for the suggestion, which I'm pretty sure this individual 
already has taken care of. I'm positive of that. I'm positive this person has looked at high end, but that doesn't tell this individual why they didn't got, get in the show. You can always press them and ask more questions. In other words, are you, did I not, did this person not get because of the quality of the work, the quality, whatever it is, you, I mean, you have to, how do you respond to this? You say, but what about the quality? Because listen, there's some, I mean, is it well painted, well sculpted? I mean, is the work of a certain level of professionalism and quality, subject matter aside? Because I, you know, I have, uh, I have been part of shows, I've seen shows where someone's painting or sculpting, it's gorgeously done. It is masterfully done. The technique, the virtuosity, all of that. I didn't particularly care for the subject matter. I just didn't like what they were doing. I didn't like the image that they were working. It's a beautiful image, painted nicely, but I didn't like it. Um, and so, and that's real. So maybe that's, so the way you approach it is you go, that's nice. Because I, I can tell you this person thought he, they were being particularly woke and, he, and helpful. But the question, but it's like, well, thank you. I mean, you respond with, well, appreciate the comment. You don't have to thank them for it. I appreciate it, or whatever, something along the line. But then start asking, and then you come back with very specific questions. Didn't like the way I handled, didn't handle this. I mean, if you can get very specific where they can't just, oh, dance around the whole race, gender issue, and you can talk about the work in and of a subject matter aside, imagery aside, then you kind of battle that. You just, you make them think about what it is. It, you know, you make people think about what they're saying to you, other than just the glib, this is the answer we're doing. And you know, um, that, like I said, when I, I saw that and I just looked like, you know, that hit me all sorts of wrong. And I'm sure it hit, I'm sure it hit our other and it was wrong too. Yeah, the, 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 the Jazz Knight example uh, mm -hmm. and, and him shining a light on that, e that horrendous email response. I mean, I think there, there's a, 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 a lot of uh, lack of transparency in the art world uh, as a whole and a lot of prejudice, where, whether it be you know, museums, galleries, curators, uh, collectors. And I, I just think the more we can shine a light on on some of these institutions and you know even you know looking at like you know what, what the gorillas gorilla girls did uh and in like documenting you know how many people of color have shown here how many you know women have they shown over the past year you know they would do mm -hmm. the, the the uh the the grade checks <laughs> um i i think it, there just has to be more transparency um well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just double checking what he has said. I mean, I don't know anything about this particular gallery. I don't know if it's, I said, you know, if, if nothing else, there's a couple other things that you can do. Um, I was thinking, is it a, is it a not-for-profit gallery, which means then it's getting some sort of funding, most likely state or federal funding. So you kind of type a letter from that type of guy, if it's, and you have some, you have something to go is a profit gallery pro privately owned you can still maybe contact whomever you can go back going thank you can you name me those prominent african-american galleries that you're talking about and if he cannot then we have an issue that means he's not look that this person wasn't looking um i also will say this because I, I, I mean I, I mean but i'm sure the other part of it is oh you're in oklahoma you don't know nothing about no art and black people and all of that. I mean, there is that. I do have people who run into that, that, oh, well, I, I, so I think there's some of that bias that you're in, a, you know, this state, you know, which make national news, we'll be making national news in the next few weeks, um, our next few weeks, excuse me, today, making national, we'll be here. And I'm sure there's a certain idea of what we have here in Oklahoma. So um, that would be what I would, you know, that's what I would think for jazz. I say, 
Tell him to give you those names. If he can't give you those names, then he's just blowing smoke up, you know, smoke up your skirt. Uh, ask very specific questions about the work itself. Be prepared for an answer, but I would ask, that's what I would do. You can be very nice about it if you want to. You don't have to be, but you can. Very respectful, very professional, but uh, uh, make a show his work. Thank you for you know, discussing that with us. I think we all really appreciate, you know, you know, having that conversation. It's one that we need to have more often, I think. Um, so that is our time. Um, there were a couple comments um, about the links of where to find opportunities. Um, I'll be sure to save those. I'm gonna to try to save the chat and I can email that to everyone so they can see the conversation that was there. Um, I'll also be uh, sharing the recording. This is being recorded and we're going to put it on um, the website and I can share it direct. I'll try to share it directly as well. Uh, technology allows it. Um, but um, I think that's it. Is there any other comments from our panelists or Crystal? Anything, you know, I'm forgetting? <laughs> uh, looks like Romy maybe wants to say something. Do you want to unmute Romy? Okay, yeah, hold on. Find her. her. I think she got it. Hey, hi. Um, the one thing I, I really thank you, Suzanne and Kyle and Jeffrey, for all of your insight. It was really helpful. The one thing that I just wanted to say for anybody who isn't familiar with what it's like on the other end of, of selecting work. If you are submitting to those national calls, those really broad calls through CAFE or through national uh, organizations, whether it is one person making that decision or art by committee, which means there are five to 10 people in the room, you need to know that the very first way that they eliminate half of the pool is by the first image. Image, yes or no, everybody votes, Ooh. set it aside. Image, yes or no, everybody votes, yes. set it aside. <laughs> Which is why I think it was Kyle who said, or maybe it was Jeffrey, I can't remember, um, who said it's really important to know what images and what order to put them in. You always wanna put your best foot forward because the first image is the one that determines whether you continue in a really significant and big way. And so good photography, strong image of your strongest work that represents a proposal or an idea or whatever it is. And that's, that's it. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That popped in my head when Kyle said that too. Uh, which, which ones you want to go first? You definitely want your strongest, most recent work first you only get that one first impression. So thanks for adding that. Yeah. Uh, I just wanna say thank you again to our panelists. I feel like this has been a really rich conversation with lots of really great practical advice for all of us to, uh, to take back with. And then as Haley said, we'll try to save the chat and we're recording this so all of that can go on our website. And uh, if everyone would be interested, we could go ahead and set out, send out the chat to everyone that registered because I know there are some helpful links in there too. Mm -hmm. So, that, thank, you, thank you all so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Guys, guys, thank you. Thank you.